Hello and a very warm welcome. It's great to have you with us for MBCF at Home. Um, today we are going to be continuing on in our series looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is some of Jesus' core teachings. Today, what did Jesus mean by these metaphors of salt and light? And we're grateful to have Phil Arben uh, over sharing with us as a guest speaker today. So stick around for that. But for those of you who are new, let me introduce uh, myself. My name's Neil. Uh, together with my wife, Jo, we lead the church here in North Berwick. We are North Berwick Christian Fellowship. We meet on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. at North Berwick High School, and you would be really welcome to join us on any Sunday if you live locally. Um, North Berwick's a great place uh, to live and visit, so do come and visit us as well. Um, if you are further afield or you're just looking to join us online in this season, then of course we uh, show our services at 7 p.m. on Sundays on YouTube. And of course you can catch up on demand afterwards. We bring you um, the short introduction, we bring you uh, our teaching, main teaching from North Berwick High School. And it's an opportunity for community. So whether you normally meet with us in person or whether you uh, watch us online, we love to hear from you. So please get in touch on email if you have prayer requests, if you just want to say hi and update us on what's going on in your life. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and build a real connection. But as I say, in a minute, we're going to join uh, with our teaching that's going to happen in North Berwick High School with Phil Arben. But before we do that, let me just pray uh, and then we'll join over there. So Lord, we thank you so much uh, for what you're doing in our lives. And we pray, God, that you would uh, fill our hearts with worship and thanks as we pause and think about all the things you've given us, all the things you're doing in our lives, God. And while we sometimes face challenges, give us a heart that's, uh, that's, that's steered towards seeing what you're doing in our lives, God. We come and we worship you and speak to us now, God, through your word. Amen. Well, it's been quite a turbulent year for us since we last saw you, because we, we've moved house, and that wasn't, uh, that wasn't something that we planned to do, but uh, it was sort of forced upon us. Um, so we don't live in a place called Langbank now, although we, we, we rather like the village, but we've moved to another posh village called Kilmacombe. Have you ever heard of Kilmacombe? It's really posh. And, um, you know, some, some houses have three garages, and some have two garages, but sadly there are some that only have one garage, and we live at the end of the village where you're given a shed. So that just sort of puts us on the sort of the social scale just a little bit, but we're very happy there, and um, in the garden we do have a chimney. So we're not totally devoid of any status symbols, if you get the drift. So it's one of those sort of places. No, it is a very, very nice place. We've got a beautiful view over the countryside, and uh, we're very happy there, and God sort of worked it all out for us. But it wasn't what we planned to do, as often life isn't what you plan to do, is it? Uh, life sort of suddenly takes a different turn, and you find that things have changed, and then you look back and say, well, you know, the Lord was in it all anyway, so we're, we're okay. So, um, but it's not far from where we were before. Uh, but <clears throat> this, e this evening, today, Neil asked me to look at the, uh, have we managed to get the, the PowerPoint okay? Because we, uh, uh, we had some technical problems earlier. So that's one of them anyway, that's, that sounds like good. So this is our reading, a very, very well-known reading. And it is from Matthew's Gospel. And uh, it's, uh, it reads like this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And if we can get the next slide... Um, there we are, we've got the next slide as well, so we're, we're, we're cooking on gas. Um, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory 
to your Father who is in heaven. And I'm sure you've heard that lots and lots of times. But I'm just praying today that God would just impress on us something fresh from that word and something that's going to challenge us on how we live our lives. Amen? Are you up to being challenged? Are you up to being provoked and uh, to think about things? So let's pray, shall we? Father, we just pray that these words of Jesus might have a, an, an effect on our lives, that it might have something that, that will change us and uh, make us think and make us different and make us as a fellowship of God's people to challenge us where we are going to go and what we're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So the next slide, um, there we are. There's a pile of salt for you. Now, very often, you know, when we think about salt, we generally, our, our mindset normally sort of goes to, well, that's what you put on your food, which is quite normal, and we'll talk about that. And we normally think of uh, salt as being something which will flavor something. And I'm sure Jesus did have that in mind. But if we track back to biblical times, we will find that, as in actual fact in today's world, that salt, <laughs> we do more with salt than just flavor our food. And so it's a huge subject. And the more you look at it, the more you realize, ah, Jesus was actually meaning quite a lot of things when he said, you're the salt of the earth. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that we possibly don't think about in our culture is that in biblical cultures, and certainly even in Arab cultures today, salt is used as a sign of a covenant. And even today, in some Arabic countries, if you are sort of agreeing with somebody, like you, you, you're agreeing a purchase or agreeing to protect each other or, hey, you and I are going to be friends in this or you and I are going to stick together on this, very often what they would do, that tracks back many, many centuries, they would take a pinch of salt and put it on each other's shoulders. And that salt was a sign that they meant business. Now, in our culture... We look for a little bit of a, a signature, don't we, on the end of a bit of a paper, and we even do that online, but imagine the idea of a signature makes the thing legal, and it makes the thing valid, and it means you are going to stick by your word. That's what we mean by a signature. But in ancient cultures, because salt was such a precious commodity, you would actually sprinkle a bit of salt to say, hey, this is our agreement. Now, we have a granddaughter. Uh, you may have met her a couple of times. We've sometimes brought her with us. And um, <clears throat> she's of that age where she will make a promise with her friends. And uh, obviously, if she says something, she doesn't necessarily do it. <clears throat> but there is such a thing called a pinky promise. Have you ever heard of a pinky promise? Okay, it's where you link your little pinky with somebody else and you promise that you will do that. And that's called a pinky promise, and you do not break it. So if, when, when Anna, if we're wanting her to promise that she will do something, we'll say, ah, but is that a pinky promise? And if it's a pinky promise, she'll do it. If it's not a pinky promise, well, apparently it's quite, op it's quite optional as to whether you keep your word. Um, and so the idea of salt is a little bit like the pinky promise in biblical and uh, former cultures. So these sort of things we suddenly think, we don't always think about that um, when we're reading the scriptures. Um, and um, for example, I'm, I'm going to give you an example from the scriptures. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 13 verse 5, for example, says that it's King, King Abijah's speech. And it's almost like a, a throwaway comment, but he says, don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? And so even, you know, for us, that's a, that's a, for them, it was a sort of a, a throwaway comment, but even that agreement was, was covered with, with salt to say, we mean business on this, and God means business with us. It's a sign of the covenant. 
And even the Levites, they were part of their remuneration from the people at large. Remember that the, the, the tribe of Levi were the priestly tribes, and so therefore money and food was given into the tithe and into the storehouse so that they could have some provision. But an important part of that is that the general public were obliged to put salt into that particular storehouse because salt was part of their income. And even in Roman soldiers were sometimes if there wasn't much cash going around, sometimes they were even paid part of their salary was a bag of salt. In fact, someone has suggested that even our word salary, sal, is connected to the word salt. So we've, in our society, we've completely forgotten the origins and the importance and the value of salt. So when Jesus uses this as an illustration, we're talking about something quite important. And even in all the offerings that the, um, that the priests used to bring, you, you might think, well, why is this important? But a lot of the offerings were sprinkled with salt. And you think, well, why would you do that? I mean, it's going to get burnt <laughs> or whatever or the grain offering offered up to God. Why was salt part of the agreement? Well, that's just exactly it. It's part of the agreement. And the fact that salt was put into so many of the offerings was a sign that it was part of the covenant. And... Um, so, and, and even in Leviticus chapter 2, it says, don't let the salt of the covenant be missing from your grain offering. So, you know, even these little details show that this was an important commodity. And I wonder what that means to us in terms of the covenant. You know, we're part of the new covenant, aren't we? And what does it mean to us as followers of Jesus? Now, well, the word that came to me was, uh, well, you know, the words of Jesus, and, you know, he was talking in the context, well, you know about all the covenants and all the, the laws and the things of the past, but a new commandment I'm giving to you, he says in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I <coughs> have loved you. And I think that's, a, that's like the salt of the covenant. How do people know about God's love? Because... God's love is seen among us. We love each other. We care for each other. We look after each other. And that's almost like the salt of the covenant. That's what we do as God's people because that's the commandment, that's the commitment, that's the covenant that we are part of. And so just to have the same attitude and the same values that Jesus had acts like that agreement and, you know, we're all very much aware, aren't we, <clears throat> at the moment of the Queen's attitude on so many things. You know, the, the number of times people are saying, oh, she had a good attitude on this and her attitude was right on this. And she always used to say that she would like to follow the teachings of Jesus. God bless her for her stand and her openness to saying, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus and I try to do the things that he taught. Thank God we had a queen like that. I do, I really do think she was an amazing lady. And in that sense, that's an example of being salt of the earth. That we could look at a lady of that status and of that importance in human terms and say, yeah, but I have one king. I have a king too, she said. That's been quoted. And uh, her, the way she lived her life, trying to do good, and doing the things that Jesus said, well, I think there was something of the salt of the covenant that she knew and that she was quite open about her faith. So that's the first thing that would <clears throat> possibly come to mind when Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. It's a reminder of the covenant. And the next slide, please. This is the one that we're <clears throat> more familiar with in that it releases flavor. I don't know what it is about salt, but um, I know we're, we're, we're possibly told that we, should, we take too much. I, I like a reasonable amount. Not too much, but, 
You know, when something hasn't got salt in it, it's, uh, it's a bit tasteless, isn't it? <clears throat> but the funny thing about salt is it has this ability to bring out the flavors of other things. Have you ever noticed that? That you, you, what you, when you put a bit of salt in the cooking, um, it's not just salt that you taste, it's other things, you know, the other herbs and the spices somehow come alive because you put salt in. Obviously, you can put too much in it, but there is something about it that releases flavor. And just the right sort of amount seems to do the trick. Um, and I think there's something for us to learn there. Okay, we have our own contribution to make in life. You know, we make our saltiness affect the dish. But the strange thing is that I wonder whether we realize just how we bring out the good in others. You know, we all have different gifts, don't we? We all have different abilities, different ways of doing things. We all bring something to the mix. And salt has this ability to release something that's not salt. <coughs> so the other herbs and the, the bits and pieces, the spices, all sort of come alive through this, if you want, maybe you want to use a word catalyst, technically it sort of just makes everything sort of come into its own. And I wonder whether, you know, we realize that we're bringing the good out of others. We're releasing flavor. And, um, you know, when someone so shows kindness, have you, have you noticed how it provokes others to show kindness as well? I mean, for, for me, when I'm in, uh, among leaders, and you find you've, you've sort of invited some sort of leader who's very prophetic, and they bring that prophetic voice, I suddenly find myself prophesying, because that prophetic voice is triggering the prophetic voice in me. And uh, there may be other things that we do, maybe worship, you know, someone who's a, a worship leader brings something, and suddenly there's worship that's released in me as well. And I think salt has that sort of ability to trigger other things that are there. And I wonder whether we should be challenged about it. not just what I bring, but how am I releasing the fragrance and the flavors that each one of us can bring? And that's the skill of a worship leader, isn't it? To sort of release everything, to let, let things really... You've, you've acted as a catalyst. And you know, sometimes when we're salt, we don't realize that's exactly what we're doing. And I can think of times when someone has just gone in to a situation and just said something, something good, something biblical, something prophetic, and suddenly it triggers everything else and other people start to bring their flavors into the situation. And so well, that's possibly the, the thing that we're, we're most familiar with. And um, one of the things I think we've admired about the queen is that her her character and she's she's always said the right sort of things and kept her cool and one of the things I admire about her is her ability not to retaliate I mean some of the things that have been said by the press I mean in the good old days they'd have been taken to the tower and had their heads locked off wouldn't they but we don't do that sort of thing these days you know, in fact, I used to make a joke when someone was cheeky to get them to the tower. <laughs> but um, they don't do that sort of thing. And, and the Queen has sort of not retaliated on things that she could have retaliated on. She could have even tried to justify herself. Uh, but no, just, well, that's what they want to say, that's what they want to say. But she knew in her own heart that she had done the right thing. And I think that's a really admirable quality. And that's salt, and that's something that we, we put into the flavor. And um, she has certainly done that, and she's to be honored for it. And I think that's what's being said at the moment. Someone who's shown grace. Where did she get that from? She got it from the Savior that she followed, no doubt. And um, so that's just one example of someone showing grace, and that's part of the salt that goes into society. So even our attitudes, and 
you know, I think that's something that really, really does challenge us. And if you're going through the Sermon on the Mount at the moment, then you'll be talking about attitudes, won't you? You'll be talking about having the right attitude, acting like Jesus acted, doing what Jesus did, saying what Jesus said. And I think so often as Christians, we're really challenged about that because, you know, we like to have our retaliation. We like to say things that are horrible. To we, we like to have our rights and all the rest of the things that sometimes comes to the fore. We, we, we fall out with people and we say this and we say that sometimes and we regret it. And so all these attitudes that Jesus had, um, that's just like the salt that goes into the mix. And the next slide, something that uh, I don't need to tell you East Coasters about, I'm sure, but salt preserves. And uh, I don't know what North Berwick was like in the, the herring, was it involved in the herring trade at one time? I know the, most of the, the East Coast, um, when I was a, a kid, we had some next door neighbors who um, eventually ended up in Peterborough, but they, sort of had made their way right from north right down to Yarmouth and when they were younger as a, a part of their yearly cycle of life he was a cooper and she was a, a fish gutter and uh, they used to follow the herring trade all down the east coast right from the northeast right down to Yarmouth uh, and um, obviously the, the, the idea of salt in, in the early days when, before ice machines came along, obviously it just you, know, you have a machine that just pours ice into the, um, the baskets full of fish now. But uh, in those days, the older days, there would have been salt that would have preserved. And so we're more than likely quite familiar with the fact that, that salt preserves things. And um, I... I wonder whether we realize that's what we're doing because we're in a changing world. And we're in a world where values are actually being threatened. Good values are being threatened. And I know sometimes we feel a little bit insecure by that because suddenly things that we would have held dear and true and right, suddenly they're questioned and you're considered to be a little bit old-fashioned because you have those views. But you know, let's, let's, let's realize that, you no, know, that's part of the preserving of salt. That's part of what we do. We're here to make things to stay. The good things need to stay. And I'm not, not saying we should just be old fashioned about things, but there are some good principles. The teachings of Jesus and the teachings of scripture. There's some good stuff that needs to stay. And shouldn't be challenged because that's what we stand for. Uh, and so when Christians stand up and say, hey, that's not right. You know, that change is actually not according to scripture. And that change of value, well, that's not a good thing. And sometimes we get a, a little bit of flack for that. But when we say, stand up and say, well, you know, that's not right. We should, that's salt. That's the preserving element of salt. And um, one of the things I really like about coming back to the Queen. Oh, well, we've got, we've got to mention the Queen, haven't we? <laughs> it's topical. So I've no apologies for mentioning the Queen once again. But I think, you know, a lot of people have said, well, some of her ideas were old fashioned. I'm quoting somebody that I was had a conversation. But she was right. And um, I went to see my, my hairdresser in Port Glasgow and... Um, and she's a real Port Glasgow lass. And I thought, I wonder what she thinks of the Queen. And her comment was, oh, she was everybody's granny. And, and I think there was something about that, that even though some people would say, well, you know, maybe some of her ideas were maybe a little bit old fashioned, or, but she was everybody's granny. And there's something that, that's the salt. In fact, most people quote their grannies, don't they? Most people's values of theology comes from their grannies. But I don't know why it is. What it is about grannies that their theology, I mean, sometimes their theology is not that good, but never mind. That's a totally different matter. But a number of people say, I, but my granny used to say, 
Okay, your granny used to say it, that's fine. So according to my hairdresser, she was everybody's granny, even in Port Glasgow. And all that she stood for as a good woman. There was salt there of something of what our world would say is possibly even a bygone age. But there's something that in her life and the way she spoke of the Saviour, she's preserving something. One of the things I really did honour her for, I think it was about three or four Christmases ago uh, on the Christmas broadcast, I was listening to her and I thought, do you know, she's more evangelical than I would dare be on telly. And she got away with it. Um, <laughs> and I thought, this is... The, I would think I was listening to Billy Graham by, by some of the things she shared about the need for forgiveness and the need to come. I think, preach it, woman, preach it. This is wonderful. Um, and, but there's something preserving about people who are prepared to stick to the scriptures and live by the scriptures, to stick to the teachings of Jesus and live by the teachings of Jesus. The next part, I'm not done yet. There's more, there's more to salt yet, did we believe? Um, now, here's one that we've possibly completely forgotten about. And uh, that is that in the biblical times, salt was used for sanitizing and for cleansing. And would you believe turning dung into compost? Now, we've got all manner of chemicals that we use these days. I mean, you go down to the shop, you don't even think about cleaning things with salt, do you? But in the old days, that's what you would have done. Biblical times, it would have been cleansing. It would have been your disinfectant and your bleach. But now, you know, you get bleach, you get disinfectant. And um, you even have to, you know, when I go shopping, I even have to, to think, now, is the loo cleaner going to be lemon or blue? And you have to make time for making a decision like that. Now, let's say the last thing in, in Tesco, well, I live in Kilmacomb now, so, um, you know, is it, is it lemon for the lavi or is it blue for the loo or red for the shed? Um, we're, we're, we're bombarded with all the, the, the stuff that you can get. And yet, in biblical times, of course, you just cleaned and sanitized things with salt. And if you were well off, well, even toilet matters involved salt. And you think, wow, you can quite see why this commodity was such an important part of daily life. And so this is another way that we are salt in this world. We have a cleansing effect. I don't know whether we realize this, but we make a difference Simply, we clean up the world. Morally, we clean up the world. You may do this in your office just by being there because your values are different. Don't think, you know, we're all terribly worried, aren't we, about the values of the world rubbing off onto us. But if we turned it round a bit and think, every time I go into my office, every time I go into a workplace, every time we go to a party in the neighbourhood, are they going to corrupt me or am I going to clean them up? And I think we need to be thinking about the fact that if we are salt, we in actual fact go into situations with good values, with biblical teachings, we have something to clean this world up by. Hallelujah. We are cleansers. We're actually getting rid of all the rubbish simply by our lives being lived. <coughs> Excuse me, in the right way. And so that might even cause contention. It might even cause conflict. But hey, our values <clears throat> are different. And um, this can be very practical as well. When Julie and I lived in, in Langbank, one of the things we used to do is go and pick up all the litter. We had a lovely walk over the back of the hill around us and one of the roads. And people just chuck their bottles out and all the rest of the stuff. It really used to annoy us. So we decided, well, we'd, we'd be part of the, the gang that went around and picked it up. And it's surprising how many more people decided to do that as well. Just picking up letter. You might think, well, there's nothing particularly spiritual about that. Hey, but we're salt of the earth. 
We're cleansers. And if we want to stand up for things morally, well, we can stand up for things practically as well. And so there's quite a few people in the village uh, do a litter pick. And that's a a very practical way of uh, showing salt in the earth as well as moral values. Next PowerPoint, nearly done here. Um, I often wonder what what did Jesus actually mean when he's saying if the salt's lost its saltiness, it's only good for trampling on. Well, of course, poor grade salt, as indeed in our own culture, is used to stop people slipping. In our particular culture, it's to stop ice being uh, there to slip on. But even in Roman cultures, you know, in Roman times, they had these smooth paving slabs and palaces and proper, you know, places of importance. And uh, to stop people slipping, in wet days, they would, again, like us in frosty days, put salt on the paving slabs to stop people slipping. But Jesus is saying, well, you don't use the good stuff for that. You use the rubbish salt to, to do that for. And so Jesus is saying... You know, what is your salt like? You know, is it this cleansing? Is it this tasting? Is it this sign of the covenant? Is it all the rest of the things we've been talking about? Or has it lost its saltiness and it's only good to stop people slipping? And that's what he meant um, when he was saying the salt losing its saltiness because we really want it to be used, good salt, for all the things that we've been talking about. And... um, uh, the, the other thing about salt is, of course, it has to mix. And that, I think, is possibly where we're not very good in the church. Certainly some of us have been brought up with a sort of a more separatist mindset where, you know, we, we've taken out of context subjects like, uh, well, friendship with the world is enmity with God, quote James. And, of course, that has to be taken into tension with Jesus eating and drinking with sinners he was the friend of sinners and so Jesus himself and his own life was like salt bringing good and making relationships and so salt needs to be in the mix whatever its function and if it's kept in its container it's not going to be effective is it and so for you and me to be effective for this salt to be effective it needs to be there in the mix. Last of all, we've got no, no time to dwell much on this, but maybe we're more familiar with this subject. But uh, the next slide is the light of the world. And we know that the, when we're the light of the world, this is one of the few titles we share with Jesus, would you believe? And um, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of of life. And I suppose these two examples, salt and light, are actually very different in the way they work. Salt mixes in with whatever and makes a difference, whereas light sort of keeps itself slightly apart and shines. And sometimes it does need to shine in the way of warning. Sometimes it needs to shine in the way of direction. And sometimes it needs to shine just in terms of illumination. And there is a place where the church of God's people need to warn. There is a place for that. And sometimes we shy away from that. There is a place for God's people to direct and say, well, this is the way. This is what should happen. And there's also a place for us to bring light into very, very dark situations. And Jesus had no shame in saying this, of people that don't follow the way, they're walking in darkness. And I sometimes think we don't realize quite how dark some aspects of our society are, but we shine a light. We go in there in the mix with the salt. We go in there, we shine in the darkness. Now, I'm going to ask Julie to... Uh, I made you a little bookmark for... If, if you just pass these around. Just something to, to go away and think about. Put in your Bibles or in a book that you're reading. It's a little bookmark for you. And it just simply says, 
You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And I'd like you this week to think about that. Maybe every time you open your book that you're reading or the Bible that you're following, just something to remind you of what we've been talking about today. And that actually in that little top bit is would you believe Himalayan pink salt? How about that? All the way from B&M in Paisley. <laughs> so, I mean, you've got something really good there. And it's real Himalayan salt. Now, the problem, I guess, is it's not going to be that much good, is it? Or useful if it's kept there. So maybe what you need to do is to get it out and crush it and put it on your dinner. But it's that act of getting it out and doing something with it might just be that little reminder that that's what my life is supposed to be like. So I'm asking that God would bless this little simple visual aid this week and that we'll be reminded of all these different functions of salt and live our lives maybe in a slightly different way. Shall we pray together? Father, I'm just asking that this little bookmark would be a prompt during this week and the following weeks for us to, to think about what it means to be the salt of the earth. And I'm asking for whatever way that this word has challenged us this morning that we would put into practice what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. In the name of Jesus, would you bless the words that I've shared? Would you bless the scripture that we've read together? Would you bless the thoughts that we've shared? Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been uh, great to have you along today. Please do get in touch on email if this is your first time watching or if you uh, live locally and you'd love to come along and visit us, you'd be very welcome. Sunday, 10.30 at North Berwick High School. If you want to stay up to date with our news and our events, you can sign up for our weekly email. Uh, the link is below if you want to do that. I hope that you have an amazing week. We're praying for you. We pray God's blessing upon you uh, and we'll catch up with you hopefully next week. Bye.